Thank you, Dimitris. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Dimitris and Jim for organizing this conference. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Um, and I've looked very much forward to this presentation, primarily for two reasons. Um, the first reason is that I'm quite new into this area of substance use, uh, especially the use of steroids in imaging hunting drugs. Um, and secondly, this uh, uh, phenomenon is uh, dynamic and it's constantly shifting, which means that it is important that we share knowledge and experience with one another. Um, and um, I think we can learn much from each other, and I think there's a lot to be done, at least I can say that from a Danish perspective. Um, but I guess uh, this also goes for England. There's a lot to, there's a lot, uh, uh, there's a long way to that point where we can honestly say to ourselves that we are doing what we can to prevent the use of these substances. Um, what I'm going to present today is a local community-based project called Olbor Antidoping. Uh, and for those of you who don't know anything about the city of Olbor, it is the fourth largest city in Denmark. Um, it is located in the northern part of Jutland. And in terms of population, there's around 210,000 inhabitants in the municipality of Olbor. Um, I was employed at this project last year while I was doing my studies at Aarhus University, section for sports science. And I was so lucky to have Ask, who's also here today, um, as my supervisor. Um, and I graduated this year in January uh, with a master's degree in sports science. Before I move on to present this project, uh, we need first to have a quick look at the national approach to uh, doping prevention in Denmark during the last uh, eight years. Um, as some of you might know, it is illegal to possess anabolic steroids, growth hormone, and EPO in Denmark and the possession of these substances can give up to two years in prison. In addition to that, uh, it is prohibited to have these substances present in your body if you train in a fitness center who collaborates with Anti-Doping Denmark, which is the national anti-doping organization. And they visit those fitness centers uh, sometimes, occasionally. And uh, if you train there, you have to deliver a urine sample um, and if it's the case that this urine sample is positive for, let's say, anabolic steroids, or if you refuse to deliver a sample, this is considered a positive sample, and you'll be excluded for two years from that fitness center and from all other fitness centers who collaborate with Antioch in Denmark. And this goes for around 50% of the fitness centers in Denmark. This poster is taken from a campaign that was launched by Antioch in Denmark uh, in 2008, um, and the message of this campaign is very clear. It says steroids are stronger than you. Um, and this message refers to this guy who is taking steroids and who has grown more muscular. But despite that, his self-esteem is still low. Um, and this poster represents actually Denmark's former strategy on the doping prevention in Denmark. And it was based on a classical media campaign like this, with focus on deterring young people from taking these substances by informing about the side effects and sometimes also exaggerating the side effects. And they focused a lot on the sanctions um, when you were training in fitness centers, which is the doping controls. This is a new poster from the new campaign which was launched in December last year. Um, and the communication in, in this campaign is very different from the former one. Uh, this is a national powerlifter called Jakob Biermann. Um, he uh, has a body weight of 74 kilograms and has a deadlift personal record of almost 300 kilograms. So he's a very strong guy. Um, and he has this quote up here which says, my goal is strength, technique and patience is the key. And there's a hashtag here saying uh, pure strength. So this campaign represents Antidoping Denmark's new strategy, um, which is based more on cooperation with fitness centers regarding common values and motivations. Um, and it has a more preventive focus, it is based on dialogue, and they are trying to embrace the more uh, reasonable and the more healthy alternative to chemically assisted training. These two posters, uh, these two campaigns, represent uh, the shift in the Danish approach to doping prevention quite well. And it was this shift that uh, fertilized the soil for these uh, prevention and dialogue-oriented interventions, which I'm here to present today. A short background about this project. In 2010, uh, the municipality staff and the local police in uh, the municipality of Olbor raised the alarm about the use of doping substances among young people in the community. Um, two years later, one of my colleagues called mm -hmm. Anti Doping Denmark um, regarding the need for local action. Uh, and she was uh, arguing that we must do something locally to prevent the use of these substances. You can't be 
only 12 uh, employees in Copenhagen and uh, think that you can prevent this on a national level. So we must collaborate with you in, in the local municipalities. And one year later, um, a pilot project was initiated in Aalborg and uh, an educational seminar was held for everyone working with young people. And fortunately, at that seminar, an <coughs> official from the Ministry of Culture attended um, and she was so happy with the outcome of that seminar that she called a colleague in, the, in Copenhagen at the Ministry of Culture uh, and told that we must do something like this in other municipalities. Um, so she made an application for public funding from both the Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of Health, uh, which led to uh, public funding was raised and established the National Project uh, and European Municipalities 2014-2017 with a total funding of almost 1 million euro. Um, and Olver Antidoping is one, of, is one of them. There are four uh, in Denmark at the moment. Uh, the project I am uh, leading builds on strong interdisciplinary partnerships, uh, which is materialized in a local steering committee who are responsible for the budget and the overall progress of the project. And they contribute with advice and inputs, which makes it much easier for me to make the right choices and get the right things done. Um, the representatives are, uh, among others, from the Council of Public Health, CIFA, which is an association of sports clubs in Aalborg, SSP, which is a collaboration between schools, social service and police, commercial fitness centers, community-based fitness centers, EGI, which is uh, a very big organization called Danish Gymnastics and Sports Federation, the local police, and a guy from the leisure section of my own department. Um, and even though we have different perspectives on this issue and we have different interests within this uh, local steering committee, we collaborate on the same task uh, and we have a common understanding of the challenge and its importance. Um, so what we do, as I said before, we, have, uh, we collaborate on the same task and the ultimate end, of course, is for us to prevent the use of doping substances among the target group. Um, and when I say doping substances, I mean primarily steroids and other image-enhancing substances. Um, our target group is young men and women aged 15 to 25. Um, and we want to recognize a muscular body as a legitimate end, as we saw in the new poster from Anti-Doping Denmark's campaign. Um, but we want to discuss the means to that end. Uh, and of course, we want young people to take the more uh, reasonable and the more healthy way to, to reach that end. We do that among other things, by educating local key persons, which could be health professionals, uh, school teachers, leisure club staff, which is, which is the case in this picture. We develop educational materials, which could be a website, we have already done that, uh, and booklets about uh, doping substances, uh, nutritional supplements, etc. And we do a lot of activities aimed specifically at the target group so that we can get this one-to-one -one relationship and discuss health-related behavior with young people. Um, this is an example from a school where me and my colleague here, who's a medical doctor, discuss health-related behavior with these, with these young people and we confront them with their own ideas of right and wrong, health and unhealthy. Um, and then we have an action plan on substance use among high school students, which is used by uh, the high schools, and that now includes uh, doping, specific, more specifically steroids. And we, of course, try to work out um, best practice in different contexts. Of course, there are some key challenges which I think act as barriers to successful doping prevention um, in, in, in a Danish perspective. And one of the key challenges is to provide scientifically based and useful knowledge so that we can provide key persons with the right knowledge, not just knowledge, but the right knowledge. Um, there is much we don't know, but there is also a lot of knowledge out there which is not necessarily based on science and based on what we know from recent research. Um, and we need to ensure that young people take more informed choices and at the same time trying to avoid encouraging them to use these substances. Um, and of course there is the myths. Uh, there's a lot of myths out there, both among the young people, but also among key persons. Uh, one of them which I'm confronted with very often in Denmark is that the use of nutritional supplements is the direct way to steroid abuse. And this is a very common myth among key persons in, in, uh, in the work I'm doing. And then we need to get more transparency within the fitness and bodybuilding community 
as Demetrius uh, mentioned, it can sometimes be difficult to to uh, to um, to see if if a body or a, a, a muscular body is 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 a natural body. Um, and I talk especially about uh, these authoritative and dishonest role models who uh, are very silent about the use of steroids, but sometimes very loud about the use of nutritional supplements and the training regimes and the, the dieting and so on. And uh, the fifth key challenge, I think, is to unite the generational gap between parents and kids, uh, because fitness has become a new sport, and it is a way for many young people to work on their identity. And it is my experience that uh, there is still a lot of uh, parents who, who don't understand their kids when they are uh, going to the gym five times a week. The last one is that we need to recognize the use of fitness doping as a public health issue at a national level, both in terms of, of prevention but also in terms of treatment. Um, we, at the moment, we have nothing to offer uh, dependent steroid users in Denmark uh, in terms of treatment. Uh, which is, of course, very unfortunate. I have formulated three questions uh, which are puzzling me at the moment, which I think um, is difficult to answer in, in some of the dilemmas that I uh, are facing every day. Uh, and I hope these three questions can stimulate some discussion here. And I'd like to not necessarily get the answers, but at least some points uh, uh, to answer these questions. The first one is, how can we convince young people who want results that cannot be achieved naturally, that steroid use is not a good idea. And the second one is, how can we provide young people with useful information without encouraging the use of steroids? And the last one, how can significant others, for instance, parents or peers, be involved in preventing steroid use? Thank you. <laughs> Any comments, questions? Yep. Can I ask two questions about outcomes? So the first one is, I suppose, what do you think the outcome of the previous approach was in terms of the exclusion of people from certain settings and presumably then their movement to other settings? Have you got any measure of that? And I suppose the second is then outcomes from the work you're currently doing around prevalence, harms, appropriate use and those sorts of things. Yeah. And to answer your first question, uh, that's a very interesting question. And and my best guess would be stigmatization. Um, uh, there's a lot of experience from, from the fitness and bodybuilding community uh, that many of them, even some of those who didn't use steroids, felt very stigmatized by this poster. Uh, and that is uh, why they've changed uh, the way they communicate to a more positive one. So I, I guess you could say that stigmatization was uh, the result. And maybe we, we have distanced ourselves from uh, these young kids uh, who actually need our, our help and, and our knowledge. And to answer your second question, this is too early to say something about uh, uh, the, the, the outcome, the results uh, in terms of uh, prevalence and harm. Um, and also I think it's, it's, it's difficult to, to define what is the success criteria. Is it just a fall in prevalence or, or is a, a raise in prevalence actually also a success if we um, reduce the harms or uh, contribute with better and more knowledge. I'm guessing that's part of what the ministry's got probably asking mm. you to look yeah. at. Though. Yeah, exactly. It's about sustainability. You, you pick one wave of young people through this, and it's quite, a, a, uh, quite an expensive approach in terms of resourcing for the people with, from different departments having to look to convey that it's good. But sustainability, mm -hmm. How you plan to mm -hmm. continue that with the next generation, that mm -hmm. from the next mm -hmm. generation? And that is a question that I would have to answer in the end of this uh, project <laughs> period. Um, <laughs> but I think uh, this uh, form of doping prevention can be done uh, quite uh, cheap, okay. um, because I'm myself actually in this project, and I don't need so much money for campaigns, for uh, leaflets and booklets and, and posters. Uh, I just need uh, myself and the knowledge we know from research to, to try to integrate and, and spread that in, in the municipality. So I think uh, doping prevention can be done quite cheaply if it is uh, done with, uh, with, uh, with thought. Yeah, I was going to ask the same thing what Paul's asking around evaluation, I suppose. And kind of, um, I think it's really important that you, if you can build in some evaluation of the programme, so to see its impact, that would be really useful because there's not that much good evidence at all around 
the impact of prevention sort of programs, over those particular interventions, all these kind of more environmental mm -hmm. approaches. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, just as a more a different question, and um, you mentioned that you've been you try to engage with kind of sports clubs and, and gyms, and community gyms, and uh, etc. I just wondered how you found that, and if you found any kind of reluctance to be involved within those settings as well with the program. And um, fortunately, we, we have a very strong sense of community in the Mishkanat Golbor, and and also among uh, the private and the commercial fitness center, they really want to contribute to to this. Uh, to the solution of this this issue, um, was that an answer to your question? Yeah, no, it's just, yeah. Um, I know that you know, here that might be quite a bit, quite a difficult thing to do, engaging with yeah. lots of the gym, gym cultures. So just yeah. interested to find your experiences. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was actually quite easy for me because when I was employed last year, my colleague uh, had done a lot of hard work to gather together this this committee, uh, and and and. I can say that the most easy, the easiest part of this project is actually the collaboration with, with the different partners, which is very fortunate. Um, very yeah. Can I ask a last question? Mm -hmm. Well, the, um, the testing, the urine testing, urine sampling in the fitness centres, is that a legal requirement? To, or is it voluntary? Do the centres voluntarily do that? Or is it. Uh, um, for the fitness centres, it yeah. is. Uh, Private fitness centers is voluntary if they want to collaborate them to yeah. Denmark. But those fitness centers were organized um, under DGI, the Danish yeah. Gymnastic yeah. Fitness Foundation, and uh, the, many of the commercial fitness centers they are obliged to, to right. collaborate with them. Yeah. 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 Maybe you can supply that ask. Yeah, but, uh, you, you're, you're completely right. Uh, the, the, the idea is that everyone is obliged to tell clearly whether they collaborate or whether they do not collaborate. Yeah. So up until now it's been that if you choose not to collaborate with Anselm together, you need to place a big sticker on your door uh, with a, a, a angry smiley saying we do not collaborate with Anselm and Denmark. So people when they enter the room see that this is a bad place. <laughs> this is a place where you do not cooperate. Uh, and, and those who do cooperate get a, get a happy smiley, <laughs> happy smiley face and we collaborate. And it's very convenient for those people who don't want to have to give a urine sample. It's the perfect advertising yeah. for them, isn't it? I'll just go there and that's yeah. fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks very much.